Good evening. Welcome to Montpelier Civic Forum. And we have another of our forums tonight. This one is on the state senate, and it joins the other state senate candidates who've been in to speak, as well as the candidates for the House in Washington County and in Montpelier in particular. Uh, Bill Fraser is on two episodes. One, he's speaking about the sewer bonds, and one, he's speaking about the parking garage bonds. All of those are excellent shows that I recommend that you watch. They're on Orca Video, of course. And tonight, we have Ann Cummings, who's running for Washington County, County Senate. Senate. Right. Ann, which campaign is this? When did you enter the Washington County Senate? This is 12. This is my 12th campaign. Every two years, um, I have been in the Senate for 22 years. What's your seniority? How many people are above, beyond 22 years in the, in the state Senate? Uh, there are several. I, I'm, I'm not the longest. I, this is a major adjustment for me because Senator Doyle was my seatmate for and so long. And he in was every senior way. in every way. And all of a sudden, the last two years, oh, I'm now the senior senator from Washington County. Um, and it's, I've never felt like I was there that long because he was always there a lot longer. So what was it like serving with Bill? You know, my best story about Bill, and I think sets the tone, is my first campaign, and I'm out at Chicken Pie Supper, and Bill set that tone in Marshfield, and I hadn't met Bill since I'd announced I was running, and I went up and I said, hi, you know, I'm Ann Cummings, I'm running against, oh, hi, he says, have you met? And he introduced me to everybody that came into that chicken pie supper. And that kind of set the tone that Washington County was always very collegial. We always worked together. There were- but Bill was a Republican, he or was is a, a Republican. Repu he is a Republican. Um, I've served with Republicans, Democrats, progressives, and Washington County, unlike some other delegations- And independents. And independents have, um, have worked together. Uh, there's very few issues that you actually deal with where there's a divergence. We work for the county and for all the people of the county. And I think I credit Bill with setting that tone of civility and collegiality. When you got in, what were you doing before, 24 years before? Um, I was doing a lot of things. Um, I stayed, I was able. I was one of the last of my generation who was able to stay home um, and raise four children. Uh, they all graduated from Montpelier High School and Vermont Colleges. And while I was doing that, I ran a small business, uh, which was a knitwear design and manufacturing business. I uh, was on the Montpelier City Council. I was on the Central Vermont Community Action Council. I was on a couple of other nonprofits and just did a lot of civic work that way. Was eventually elected mayor and served as mayor for six years uh, during the flood. Um, so that was. No, that's not the Irene flood for those no, of you who are wondering. No, that's which flood not, would that have been? Uh, like? It didn't have a name. It was the Montpelier flood. It was an ice jam. Right. And we had six to eight feet of water on State and Main Street. It came up, and about eight, ten hours later, it went out just as fast. The ice jam broke. Uh, but it was a major event for the people that were here, um, you know, had their businesses pretty much destroyed. When you were first elected decades ago, what was an issue that you felt strongly about that was a state issue? Now, you at that point had been on, on the city council, so you realized right. as a charter city, you know, that you were subservient to the state in, in a number of ways. Yes. Uh, there was, I think the issue we had worked on most was the payment in lieu of taxes. Um, when Could you I, explain what that is? Okay. 30% of the city of Montpelier is tax exempt. Most of that is the state complex. State doesn't have to pay Montpelier any taxes. But if there's a demonstration, it's the Montpelier police. If somebody gets sick, hurt, has a heart attack, it's Montpelier's 
fire and ambulance. If there's a fire, it's the Montpelier Fire Department that comes. And the state was not reimbursing us. We had, at that point, we have a little over 8,000 people that lived here, but we had 20,000 people a day in town that we were providing services for, and most of them were at the state. Um, Mayor Romano, before me, had started working with the state, and at that point we were receiving, I think it was $35,000 a year. Which uh, seems token. It was pretty token even that long ago. And so we really worked. Uh, Ryan Cotton was then the city manager. He and I were up in the state house every Wednesday morning at 8 o'clock, uh, Tuesday morning, when the legislator started. To there to just make contact with our legislators, we started a program called Copilot. There's a lot of towns that have state. Most notably, um, Waterbury. Waterbury. Barry. Um, but almost every town has a salt shed. Has if you have a state forest, you got some payment for that. If you have a state building, you didn't. And it was interesting because it was. Uh, you know, you'd go up and they'd look at you like, you you know, you had two heads. This was crazy. Um, but we persisted, and it has now become just a matter of course that the city of Montpelier gets a significant payment in lieu of taxes. But every time that I talk to a mayoral candidate, or every time I talk to Bill Fraser about the budget, I hear them talking about the pilot program being insufficient and out of I, and out of touch. Yeah, Are I, they right, or is this simply um, you know, I'm the not moaning on, that you would uh, always hear from Montpelier, Waterbury, and, um, and the like? I, I've heard now it. Now that you're on the other side. I have heard it from Waterbury, and, you know, it's not something that's just going to come your way. Money is very tight up at the State House, and it's... There's more people that don't benefit from payment in right. lieu of taxes than do. So, like everything up there, it's a give and take and a negotiation. And I think the towns are always going to be pushing, and the state's always going to be pushing back, and you get, eventually you get some equilibrium. But you, you have to push, and you have to work at it. Money is tight now. Was money yes. tight then, in 24 years ago? Oh, yes. Okay, so the money has always been tight. No, I, I, I think there were a couple years where we actually had money. Um, we're very much tied to the, the economic cycle. Um, I went in in the late 90s, and we had just done the adjustment down. And I can remember saying to the city manager that year before, just we're going to go up this year and we're going to say, hi, just remember us. We know things are tight, so we're not going to ask you for more money this year. But remember us when times are good. Because walking through the halls, you could feel the pain. Money, what turned out to be not sustainable, one-time money had been put into things like universal kindergarten. Um, there was something about cutting. Um, it's one of those stories that stays in the state house. They had the proposal was to co cut public TV funding, and Big Bird did an ad. And I've had people that were there then saying, "I am never taking on Big Bird again." Well, I think the House Republicans <laughs> learned that about four years ago in the, on the federal level. Yes, you know, you just. Uh, but it was it was very tight. Um, we came back. And there was a real discipline there. Uh, tried very hard on appropriations. I think at that point, Jeb Spaulding took over appropriations. And tried to say, all right, this is a sustainable growth level. This is Jeb money. Spaulding, who now is over the colleges. That's right, and was the state senator at that time. Um, and uh, we tried to just grow at what we thought was a sustainable revenue level and then anything else uh, went into one-time spending and this we we went through the last great recession um, we have we're just starting to come out of that and just starting to come out in what sense revenues are just starting to pick up um, Vermont usually lags behind the nation 
in economic re regrowth. And this has just been a long, um, slow recovery. Now, in terms of uh, when this is being taped, um, Moody's downgraded our bond. Our bonds are still excellent. They are very excellent. But it's one step below very excellent to just right. excellent plus. Uh, and they, if I'm correct, and help me if I'm wrong, they cited three factors. One is our aging population. One is our sluggish economic Hi. growth, which you spoke of. And the third was our looming pensions. Okay. Um, let's start with the looming pensions. Let's, okay. Because that was one that came up in the legislature late last year, uh, if, if I'm right. And that was when there was surplus money mm -hmm. available. And the question is, where should that surplus money be spent? And we're back to that same question of one-time use or investing in chiseling away to some degree our pension Which, obligations. Right. Could you say where you stood on that and why? Okay, that I was right in the middle of it. Um, Why were you right in the middle of because it? Because I chair the finance committee. And you were right in the middle of I it. I was right in the middle of it. Um, to, to start with, because I've heard the word debt and pensions come up, um, it isn't a problem with the pension system that we have. It is a problem with, I believe, before my time, um, the theory was that the pension money is invested in the stock market and that you could use the, the stock market was booming and so the money was that we were making in the market was used to cover the state's obligation to put money into the fund. I've been told that this was a, a gray area in the accounting standards, and it's my understanding that we were not the only state that did this. Then times got tough, and we didn't have the money to put in everything without making even more painful cuts. And this continued. This was a bipartisan, multi-administration, multi-legislature. Um, we knew it was there. We knew we were obligated to fund the pensions that we had to pay out. Um, as well as the future pensions. As it, yes. Right. And, um, but then the feds changed the accounting standards. Now, and, when would this have been, uh, roughly? Might have been seven, eight years ago. Okay. Um, they changed the standards. And what so we, it would have been during a recession. Uh-huh. And they came up and said... Uh, what was gray is now black. You can't do that. That is an unfunded liability, and you will pay it out, and here is the penalty, and here's the interest you're going to pay, and here is the principal. This is what you owe. And we have been paying that, painfully paying that ever since. And so last year when we had one-time money. Which was approximately how much? I think it was... It was, it was like, is it 30 million? I think it was 32. Something in that range. Um, and we weren't sure, we were suddenly getting more business taxes. And we thought we knew why maybe, but we weren't sure. And so the governor wanted to use that to buy down the, the property taxes, to put it in to, to lowering the tax rate. Problem with that is last year we were, uh, supposed to have a nine cent tax increase. And five of that was because we had done what the governor wanted the year before and book savings from teachers' health care that didn't materialize. So if we put one time money in and covered five cents or three cents, we're kicking it down the we're road. We're kicking it down the road. It's paying your mortgage on your credit card. But that cost is still going to be there next year, and the one time money isn't. And, but if we put it in to pay down our debt and take it off the principal, we would save millions of dollars over the life of that debt. Uh, it's like paying down the principal on your mortgage. And since we just felt that was a much more prudent way to spend money that we didn't think would be reoccurring. How does the story end? Um, 
we put the money into the one-time um, funding most of it at the end. Uh, we so may we, kicked, have we kicked it down? No, we put it mostly into paying down oh, the pension. Okay, so basically on the margin, we're still faced the following year with those same kinds of we, painful choices. We, the Appropriations Committee has the payment schedule. I've been told that this is this was the worst year, that it'll start to ramp down. So it, it's not going to get any worse, but that payment has been eating up any increase in revenues between that, the school payments, and Medicaid. There hasn't been money to do anything else. How do we clean up the lake? We had a bill that was passed that said yep. we're going to clean up the lake, and is the result of that bill yet another task force or yet another report? You know, there's, there's lots of ideas out there about how we can clean up the lake. One bill that went through and got vetoed originally called for a task force to, you know, and then there was a task force set up and they, the governor set one up and they came back and said, well, we aren't going to make any recommendations because the administration has said, we're not raising any new money and we're not raising any taxes, we're not raising any fees. And it's hard to see how you're going to do a $20 million a year cleanup without raising didn't any the new money. treasurer interject herself into that discussion? The original discussion, originally, when this came up, the treasurer was tasked <laughs> with coming up for a plan. And she came up with a plan that said for the first, I think it was two years, maybe four, we could use some of our bonding to um, do some of the work. It's long-term work. We, you know, we do things with banking and roads, and we could do that. But it was going to take more, and she had several suggestions that the legislature should look at to come up with the rest of the money. Did they? No. Why not? Because we were told very clearly that if we came up with any new revenue they source, would it would be vetoed. And we have a very limited block of time and you kind of find yourself, you know, you lose enthusiasm for really working on something and, you know, staying till 10 o'clock at night and putting your heart and soul into this thing and then finding out it's just been vetoed. When the next legislature starts, now everybody, I think the governor, I think the legislature, I think collectively all of you were frustrated at the end dealing with school finance Yes. at the very end dealing with school finance at the very beginning and then dealing with school finance at the very end. Every year. Is, is there a way that the process could be improved in, in your mind so that it starts at the beginning and systematically ends itself before the 11th or uh, 11th hour? It's a very, I think the system works as well, and it has lasted longer than any other system we've had. What would other systems we've had be? Uh, oh, there was the Miller, Miller formula, and there were uh, there were several. School You're talking about the school fund, the statewide school funding formula yes, itself, right? Okay. That were that were put in, um, but they depended on the state coming up with the money, and we didn't always come up with the money, and it went on the local tax rates. And then we had the Brigham decision, which... What was the Brigham decision? Brigham decision, um, there was a lawsuit brought, and it said, look, we've got ski towns, form, sometimes That's called the, the gold decision. towns, the equity decision, that it can't cost... We had towns with $3 tax rates that were able to raise less money than towns with 28 cent tax rates because of the amount of uh, grand list. And a lot of the grand list in places like second home towns didn't send kids to the school. So you had all this property to tax and not too many kids. You had other towns that had nothing. You're talking about the Northeast Kingdom. The Northeast Kingdom standard was the, the poster child. 
Um, I think they had over $3 tax rates, and some of my towns had 28 cent tax rates. Brigham said that kids have a right to an equal education. It is based, and where it isn't necessarily money, but money is part of it, the disparity is too large, and the state has to find a way to equalize that. And the result was Act 60. So what we're doing is nibbling around the edges of Act 60, is what you're saying, except for one proposal that would lessen the dependence on property and have more dependence on, on income? As it's, it is right now, it's, it's a mixture of both. It's a mixture of both. The majority of people, 65, 70 percent, pay based on a percentage of their income, and that was by design. Which they call income sensitivity. We call income sensitivity. Um, above that, they, base, they pay the full freight on their property. Um, there is some feeling that we should put more, you know, if people paid the full, the same percentage, you know, did like a flat rate, um, then we would, we could lower it probably for lower people, yeah, and, and have more money and do all kinds of stuff with more money. The thing that concerns me, and that I think we could go more, you know, do more income into it, but as you get to higher income levels, um, income tax tends to be very volatile. That's the state is income dependent, and that's why you get our feast or famine, okay, ups and downs. States big. We can rob Peter to pay Paul and get through. Sometimes Peter moves out of the state then. Sometimes. Um, schools aren't. Schools have one mission. And so we have always, as a state, uh, tried to have stability in school funding. I know in the city, um, the school sets the budget. City council has to accept or approve it. But if the money doesn't come in, if a major building or the half the city burns down, the city has to pay the full freight to the, the schools, and the city has to, make, has to swallow the loss. Doesn't it go through the state, though? It does the now. Filter of the it state does now. now. So that, but that if was, half the city were to burn down, they would still get there. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's the level that we've gone to make sure that you can't open school and then say, "Oh, but we're ex." You know, we can't. We got to fire three teachers today because the money's short. So we've tried. We, you know, you you try and find a system that is stable and the higher you go in income the the more unstable it becomes um, and so you you wanna you wanna find which is part of of the legs of the the three legs that Mooney was was talking right. about which is our aging population our decline well not declining but our sluggish economy we haven't picked up as fast as the rest of the country how do you see us picking up? What, what do you see as Vermont economies that we can realistically, we're not gonna get Amazon headquarters to? No, we are not. Um, we seem to do very well with startups. We've done Ben and & Jerry's and coffee roasters, you know, and uh, web, web grocers, and um, we seem to do that. I really think there's some interesting models showing up around the, the country. Um, Right now we do veggie, Vermont in, in yeah, economic growth incentive, where you get, a, it's really a rebate on your taxes, but you get money back. Um, you go in, you apply, and you either are expanding, or you, and you're in, basically you have to increase employment, and it has to be at a better than the, the going wage, and it has to have good benefits. If you produce good jobs, then the state gives you an incentive. But that's a one-size-fits-all. And there's models like Boston where they've done a real assessment of, um, you know, what's their strength, what their weaknesses. This is the one area where we tend to get bogged down in partisanship. You know, it's like you can't plow on any cornfield and build anything in it. And no, you just have to do away with, you know, lower taxes and do away with regulation. 
and we don't really seem to talk to business. And I think we really as a state need to sit down and have business of all sizes and kinds talk with us and find a way to tailor make things to help what I would see as startups. And once they get big enough, they seem to need to move out because we're in a transportation cul-de-sac and they can't get their product to market easily. How do you keep kids um, in Vermont? I think... When I talk about kids, I'm speaking of people in their 20s. I'm yeah. old enough to call them kids Kids, now. they're kids. Um, you know, my kids all went away for a while. They went away either to school. Three of them are back. The fourth would if his wife could find a job that pays what she gets paid in Montreal. Um, I think our... I think, but I think kids today are on the internet. They see the world, the, you know, and I think they're, they're going to want to go out and they're going to want to see it. I think what we really need to do is market that this is a great place to raise a family to, uh, you know, we don't need a bunch of, uh, you know, 20-somethings partying. We need families that are, are here, that are stable. And I don't think we do enough to market how good we are. You know, we had a governor who, every time he spoke, said Vermont's bad for business. Now, you know, it's, well, we're old and we're tired. I mean, who'd want to come here? Um, I think we need to change our rhetoric and start talking about what's good about Vermont. And why would you? It's safe. The air is clean. We don't have tornadoes and hurricanes. And, I mean, we had Irene, but the one before that was in 1927. Do we have the housing for those people? No. And what can the, what can the state legislature do, in, in your mind, to increase our housing stock? We did come up with a $36 million right. bond last year um, to increase affordable housing. And part of it is just the house, the the price of raw materials. It is very difficult. I'm, In a state with lots of lumber. Yes, I am a I am a realtor. Um, That's why I asked the question. At least for the next few months, um, I'm in the process of retiring or phasing out. Um, you know, the cost of raw material, you, you sell your big house and think you're going to downsize and build a little ranch, and it ends up costing you what's your big house you sold for because things like copper was up, plywood was up, um, just basic costs are up and the cost of land in New England is very high. What about, speaking of land, what about uh, Act 250? It's been in for a while, a long while now. Mm -hmm. um, would you see the state legislature revisiting 250, not to get rid of it, but to do a substantial rethink of our land use policy, our core of land use policy? You know, I think Act 250 went in. It was Dean Davis, a good Republican governor, that did it. Um, because suddenly in the 60s and 70s, there were, it was the back to the land movement and people moved here. We're now writing books about it. And there was a real concern that developers would start building houses and all, you know, and we'd start to look like Long Island, where I lived as a kid. And it was. It was potato farms that just had wall-to-wall -wall houses put up on it. And there was, and we, we still have towns that have no local zoning. <laughs> uh, we had no zoning. We had no planning. We, it, it hadn't been an issue. Um, I think it did its job, and I think it continues to do its job. Um, I think, again, this is where we need, not just as a legislature, but as a state, to talk about, okay, we need housing for people. We've got some of the oldest housing stock in the country, and outside of Chittenden County, not very much is going up. Um, housing prices are high. And so how do we do that? We, we are building affordable housing. Uh, but how do we help 
gov what can government do without putting its own dollars in? Is there anything I, that government can do to I, ease, ease the regulation a tad or, or to... Um, I think it's trying to find out what e regulations to ease. We have done downtowns. We have done na neighborhoods contiguous to downtowns and given them some break from the regulations. Um, you know, we, I think we need to continue to do that. I think one of the things we could do, and my experience comes with trying to site a water filtration plant in a neighboring town, um, Montpelier's water source is in Berlin, and going through state permitting, and there seemed, you know, you were going through the Natural Resources Department, and there seemed to be a lot of people who were very f focused on the environment and not making any. And the city of Montpelier was very happy with just dumping chlorine in the water as it came mm -hmm. down the hill and didn't really want to have to put up this plant. Um, and so trying to, you know, and, and they'd say, okay, I've got six weeks to, to give you an answer. And I'll, I'll see, you know, they, and they said, and it was five weeks and six and a half days generally before you'd get the answer. And I don't think they understood that when you're a business, that time is money. Well, most of the Act 250, from what I gather, I might be wrong, uh, they get through in a fairly timely they do. manner. It, it's just on the outliers. There are a few hell. outliers. Um, and I think, I think the you know the word is out that it's very difficult, and for most it isn't. I think we could be a little more understanding of the of the issues that business you know has. They I can remember them saying to me with the you know, well um, if you draw down more water than this, you'll have to make remediation. Well. What are you talking about? Well, we won't know till we get there. And I said, well, are we talking 10,000 or 10 million? You know, I mean, that makes a difference to me. I mean, I'm not a business. So what do you do if you're a profit-making business that is being just kind of Well, let's talk about the profit-making small business. Yes. Healthcare. Now, there's a national move afoot on skin, so-called skinny health care plans that yeah. would strip off maternal, the, the need to offer maternal care, the need to offer psychiatric care, so uh, any kind of, of, of care, but you'll end up with a policy that has a monthly premium that's you a lot afford. less. Would you, um, would, now a lot of these are required by state law, by the way, in Vermont. Yes, they are. Uh, would you favor selling skinny policies that, uh, are more afford that are cheaper and more affordable? No. Why not? Um, when we first moved here, my husband's health insurance did not cover maternity. So when we were told to get a rider, it would be cheaper to save up the money, and we did. Um, but we were, you know, we were able to do that. Um, it used to be, my son graduated from high school, he was gonna go backpacking for a year, his sabbatical year, yeah. Um, he was out of school, so he was off our policy. He, a couple hundred dollars, he got a, a, a policy. Plan. Yeah, skinny policy. Um, but the, and there were many companies that that's what they did. They sold skinny policies to healthy people. The minute you reached an age where you might need health care, the minute you got sick, or had pre-existing or conditions. had pre-existing conditions, you couldn't you could get health care if you could come up with a, an exorbitant amount of money. I mean, a large number of people could not afford it, and so what Vermont did before my time, so over 20 years ago, they said, "Look, this is." You, you are going to take Vermont as a pool. And when my son, who is 20, 
he's going to buy insurance and he's going to pay in and he probably won't use anything for 10 or 15 years. But then when he is older and gets sick, he'll pay less than he would have, you know. So you need a big pool. We do this with all other kinds of insurance. You know, you've got a big life pool, insurance, life, auto insurance, home, right. okay, um, yeah, fire, car. But most of us never total our cars, burn down our houses. You know, most of us never put in a major claim. And when they do, they up your rates. Um, or they let you go. But most of us will put a claim in, and if we live long enough, most of us will put a major claim in to your health insurance system. It's a very, so it costs more. Paid parental leave yes. came up before less. It's in the same boat, I imagine. It is. Could you explain what the thinking was on paid parental leave on both sides? I think on one side it was we can't afford it. Um, we I, can't afford it or we don't want it. No, I don't think we don't want it. I uh, have actually been putting a paid parental leave bill in for 10 years. I. I had originally funded it out of the unemployment insurance um, and backed off a couple Now, what would the paid parental bill okay. cover? I did this because my son and his family live in Montreal. My daughter-in-law got a year's paid leave. It was tied to her unemployment insurance. Um, she didn't take the year. And it, you know, it's a reduced amount, but it was enough to help pay the mortgage while she was out and able to stay home with my grandson. Um, and I watched that, and I watched the bonding. At the same time, I am watching young lawyers that work for the state, watching their, what, it's getting near noon, I gotta go nurse my baby at the daycare, or you'd hear the breast pumps in the ladies' room, you know. And I'm thinking, how can you bond with the child when you're so stressed? And yet that bonding is so important for the rest of that child's life and that family's life. And so I knew, you know, I knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. I put it in and I put it in because I thought it was something we should talk about. And it would be a selling point to and younger families. That's, and I, the more I think about it, I think, yes, if we want to, attract younger families here, say, this is what you can do in Vermont. We set it up as a form of self-employment. That's modeled on New York, where the employees actually pay in, it was like a couple dollars a month, um, and it's expanded to family leave, so that those of us that have elderly parents um, that need to go to the doctors or need someone, you know, to help them, can do that. Now you um, got a boost in the last session in term it it passed? It passed. It did. And its fate? It got vetoed. And it didn't get overrun. It no. We, we, Will it be introduced by you again? Uh, or a version it, of it? It will get reintroduced and I'll be a sponsor, yeah. Right. A version will I'm sure we'll go back. What do we'll you see in the next legislature being reintroduced? Obviously pot is coming up. Oh, yeah. What, what's your view on that, <laughs> on how to deal with Montreal now, Maine, Massachusetts? We're getting encircled. We are, and we knew that when we did the first bill. I supported the Senate bill. I think it really worked at getting a, a regulated system so we knew who was growing what. And what the quality and was. And what the quality was. Um, and making sure things didn't get laced with things, and it was taxed. There will be additional costs for law enforcement. There will be, you know, we, we're already doing prevention programs. Um, you know, it, I've been looking for sin to tax for years because it's the only thing you can tax. Are we going to do um, uh, gambling, uh, sports gambling? Do you see that coming up? Gambling is much harder in this state. I, okay. That would be a much harder sell. That's a sin. Yes. That's, yeah, we could tax that, couldn't we? 
But I mean, that's, that's, I mean, cigarettes are the one thing you can tax and nobody cares. Of course, the more Except you tax it, the less you, you bring in the less, in the long run. Well, we, and that has started, the, the cigarette. But we, the governor vetoed, um, we had two bills that went through. Um, one was a tax on e-cigarettes because they are becoming a major issue in schools um, with young people. I mean, what adult buys bubblegum flavored cigarettes? Uh, they are marketed to young people. Uh, that we couldn't get through. My committee put an opioid, a tax on opioid producers feeling that they made the money off of opioids. Um, and in some cases knowingly, uh, and that they, we are looking at decades right. of costs, um, the damage to individuals, to families. Uh, we are going to be paying that cleanup cost for a long time, and they should help. The drug importation from Canada. Yes. How many years were you working on that? Many. Um, when I first started in finance, pharmaceutical costs were, we had the uh, new, it started out as New England legislators um, coalition on, on pharmacy pricing. Uh, Bernie was taking buses to Canada. Um, pharmaceuticals are much more inexpensive in Canada. Um, we got major pushback from the pharmaceutical industry. We tried to uh, set a contract with, I forget the name, it was a pharmacy in Illinois, Michigan, that sourced from Canada. So now that is law and we've put into the federal government for the necessary paperwork, and we're waiting for that possible and probable rejection. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, I, I don't know the federal government has any reason to help Vermont at this point. Um, you know, we keep trying. Um, it is very frustrating. Pharmaceuticals, before the opioid epidemic became a cost, pharmaceuticals, Medicare was set up when going to the hospital was your major cost. Right. And you, you generally you went to the hospital, you died. Um, now, if you go to the hospital at all, it's in day, you know, in one day, and you are treated with pharmaceuticals. They are, you may, and they're coming out with new ones every day, and they do miraculous things. But that's something that's macro, but, well beyond. Oh yeah, Vermont. It's well beyond Vermont. Vermont. And thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. I so appreciate, and I want to say how much I appreciate you watching this show and becoming informed about the election. Please watch the other shows, the other state Senate candidates, the House candidates, watch Bill's show on the parking garage bond and on the sewer bond. But more important than that, get out and vote. Get out and vote on November 6th. Tell your neighbors and your family to vote. That is not only a duty, but an obligation. Thank you so very much.